Hey y'all, welcome back to the Hack Shack. Today we've got another box from the folks at Hacker Boxes. This is Hacker Box 103, and the name is Homebrew. What the beer has ingredients? Let's get this on the bench and see what we have inside here. First, we have a NES style controller. Here's some various values of resistors for the Pico 56 kit. Here we've got some NES style controller jacks. This is our DB15 VGA style connector. Here we've got two RCA style connections for audio. There's a barrel jack. Here's a PS2 keyboard connector. This is a USB to barrel style power connector. This is the Type-C Raspberry Pi RP2040 module. And remember, do not connect this RP2040 module to the kit until you've reflashed it with the Pico 56 firmware. This module is slightly different than the official Pico 2040. This is a 951 solder flux pin. Here we've got a USB SDXC card reader. Here we've got an eight gig micro SD card. And here is the Pico 56 PCB. Check it out, this is really cool. This is gonna be the main thing we're dealing with here in this box. Wow, check out this bling. This is the exclusive Leet Hacksaw golden keychain. That's a trip. And we've got some more things for the Pico 56 kit. An SD card slot there, some buttons, some capacitors, a couple of LEDs, some things we're gonna need to finish up the kit. This is the exclusive hack oval sticker. Oh yeah, and I think I know what this one is right here. This is the time hacking sticker, and you know, that's cool. And as always, last but not least, the Hackerbox 103 collectible reference card. Before we move on, I'd like to take a moment to thank today's sponsor, PCBWay. Did you know you can get custom PCBs made starting at only $5? And in addition to their PCB prototype service, they also offer PCB assembly, CNC machining, 3D printing, sheet metal fabrication, and injection molding services. Please give them a look. And again, we thank PCB Way for being today's sponsor. Homebrew might mean a basement concoction, but in the 1970s, it meant something more. Passionate hobbyists, fueled by ingenuity, built their own computers. They weren't concerned with pre-built kits, just a thrill of creation. The homebrew movement wasn't about machines, it was about the journey, the late nights, and the shared love of making something from scratch. Let's hear from the Waz himself from this clip from 1984. The first microcomputer club started, and the first one in the country, we believe, was the Homebrew Computer Club in uh, Silicon Valley. And the word homebrew gives you a good idea of where the home computer thinking was in those days. It was that it was people who would build it themselves, you know, little technical fringe elements that wanted to have electronics as a hobby, you know, not just as a useful, so they could have useful tools in their house. Fast forward to, well, a few years back, actually. This is the HBC 56, a fantastic project by Aussie tinkerer, Troy Schrappel. This was a neat design where various modules fit on a common bus, not too unlike those computers of days gone by. This is not the exact thing we'll be working on in this video, but I'll let Troy explain why, and more importantly, show us what we'll be working on. So this is the Pico 56. The Pico 56 is a modern take on the HPC 56, a 6.5 CO2 based homebrew computer on a backplane. It's pushed down and emulated on a $4 Raspberry Pi Pico microcontroller. Ever since I released the first videos on the HPC 56, I've had numerous requests to release a kit version, which is awesome. However, it's quite an undertaking given the HPC consists of a backplane and five or more add-on cards, some of which contain chips which are no longer manufactured, such as the classic TMS9918 VDP. The scale of the HPC would make it quite expensive for what it is, but to start out I wanted to test the waters with a more manageable project, which is approachable by all experience levels. That's where the Pico 56 comes in. A single Raspberry Pi Pico microcontroller handling the 6.5 CO2 emulation, the TMS9918 VDP, and the dual AY38910 PSGs, while interfacing with real hardware, such as the VGA display, PS2 keyboard, 
stereo audio outputs and dual Nest controller ports. I've also added a micro SD card slot as a convenient means of loading HPC 56 ROMs and saving and loading basic programs. The really neat thing about the Pico 56 hardware is it can be used by any project which interfaces with these hardware devices. Just adapt my Pico firmware or write your own from scratch. It doesn't need to be a 6502 based project. You can emulate any other retro CPU or develop for the Pi Pico directly. Just like they always do, the folks from Hacker Boxes have included a great set of instructions here available on Instructables. I have a link to that in the description. Even if you don't have the Hacker Box, you might find it pretty handy. Okay, after the intro parts of the Instructable, the first thing it really has us mess with here is the RP2040 module. And again, we're going to do that first because we want to make sure we get it ready to go and get it reprogrammed. You don't want to power this up inside the completed Pico 56 board until after you flash it because there may be some trouble so please 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 remember to do this first and all i'm doing here is i'm going to use a breadboard to kind of position my header pins so i can just solder that into place so that's what i'll be doing here just basically soldering the pins in to the rp2040 after soldering i give it a quick once over make sure everything looks okay and then move on to the next step which is plugging in the USB-C cable and making sure it just does the basic light up and this is the rgb doing its thing with the default programming and this is the programming we need to get off of there before plugging it into the board we'll complete later all right so next the instructable is telling us to put the 2040 module into bootloader mode and we do that by holding the boot button down at the same time that we hit the reset button and when we do that you'll see a new thing pop up here like a new drive see that there we go okay so next the instructable tells us to browse to the pico 56 repository on github we go to latest under releases and then we download the uf2 file and the roms file then we're going to take that uf2 file and we're going to drag and drop it over to that drive that popped up earlier when we plugged in the rp2040 and like it says here don't worry about the rom file we'll use it later next we're going to power cycle the rp2040 as instructed and then once we plug it back up and it's booting that new code you should see that the RGB LED is not doing anything now, which is what we're seeing here. So that means that's good. Okay, next the instructable tells us that we should probably tackle the micro SD card slot next. And that's also what Troy recommends. Now in the instructable, it advises you to use the included flux pin. Now, I don't have anything against flux pins, but I really like the normal flux that I usually use from my syringe. And that's what I'm gonna use. But just to show you here, I'm gonna use another clip of Troy's to show how it works. You just press it down and kind of prime it up and you apply it where you want it. This is when I'm doing my kit here. You can see I'm just squeezing out some of my flux kind of all the way over these pads and even the pads here at the back around the edges. Then I get the SD card slot out of the package and use those locating pins and kind of drop it into place. And the first thing I solder are those outside perimeter pads. Then I load up a little solder on my tip and just drag across, trying to prevent it from clumping up and making sure to try to avoid any solder bridges. Then I got these two inside support pads. Then a little cleaning with some IPA and a brush. So as I've said before, I'm not that great with the color bands on resistors. So I got my meter out and checked all the groups of resistors and labeled them accordingly so I could have an easier time when putting them into the board. Next, I just populated the board with the resistors based on the silk screen values as indicated. And then I soldered them in and cut off the leads. Now, this is a little bit messier than you probably want it to be, but you know, you do you. You could always do smaller sections at a time so it's not so crazy on the back side of the board. So the next few components I did, I thought I was recording, but I was not. So let's we'll start with this one. This diode, just want to show it matches the silk screen. The band goes in that direction, matches the line. There's nothing special about these ceramic capacitors. They have no polarity and they just go in. These electrolytics, the short leg or the negative leg will go in this direction on the PCB. Nothing too hard there. And on these LEDs, the negative or short leg goes toward the flat spot as indicated on the PCB silk screen. Next, I use a little bit of putty to hold the female headers in for the 2040 module. 
and soldered those in. I installed the power and reset switches next. The power switch legs weren't quite right, so you can see I used the pliers a little bit to spread the outside legs, and that allowed that to get in there a little easier. Then I soldered both of those in. Next, I put in these NES controller sockets, and the pins were a little tough and didn't quite line up perfectly. And I got the first one to go in just by manhandling a little bit. I got the second one in by using some pliers and kind of bending these pins back like this a little bit, and then I was able to get it in there. So if you're doing this, don't get too dismayed. It has to have a little bit of elbow grease to get in there. And then it's no problem to pop it the rest of the way in and then solder them up. Next was this capacitor, but as I look here right now, I realized that I installed it wrong. That positive goes toward the power jack and the stripe or the negative should go toward the outside of the PCB. I'm gonna have to fix that later. So don't do it like I'm showing you here, flip it around. Next was this transistor and it just goes in the way that it matches on the silk screen to the shape of the transistor itself and that's that. Then I put this barrel jack in, it really only goes in one way. And then I put in the PS2 jack. Then these RCA style audio connections, red goes for right and left goes for the white. The last thing to be soldered in is this DB15 VGA connector. With the board build complete, all that was left to do now was to plug in the 2040 module. I then tested out that USB to barrel jack power connector and that seemed to work okay. I got my old grungy IBM PS2 keyboard out of the garage and plugged that in. And then plugged in my VGA cable. Then I plugged in my RCA to 3.8 stereo adapter. And with that, we were ready for our first test. Connected up power and let's see what happened. Looks like we've got something called EH basic here or enhanced basic, but I can't help to think that it could be basic. And you know, I can't look at a basic prompt without at least doing one of these. The next thing the Instructable talks about doing is playing with some of the ROM files that we downloaded earlier. So to do that, I opened up this reader that came with the hacker box and opened up the SD card that came with the hacker box and stuck that in the PC. And when that popped up, I dragged over the opened up ROM zip and put those files onto the SD card. Then stuck that SD card back into the Pico 56 and fired it back up. And now you can see when you boot up, you get this list of items. Now, what I observed was that anything I tried to load seemed to error out. For the heck of it, I went ahead and reformatted it and put the files back on it again. And then I could load the files off of the SD card with no problem. It seems like some other folks might have had the same issue according to the instructable comments. I bet you might recognize this tune. This was a neat program in the menu that lets you test your NES controllers out. And you can plug in your controller to your port, and then as you press your buttons, you'll see them indicated on the screen here. Then I moved it to the second controller port and did the same thing, so that's kind of neat. Check out some of these other ones. This is a neat one that was linked from the Instructable. This is a cool creation from community member Frank Fletcher. Pretty neato. One thing that caught my attention was that the basic examples from the SD card didn't show up in the menu here. Now, if you get into basic and you know the name of one that you want to load, like I do here, you can load it up, but there's no way to list it. I looked around to see if there was a command to do that and my searching came up with nothing. 
I asked around and then at last I actually asked Troy if there was a way to do that. And he actually told me there was not a way to do that. I didn't think it was that big of a deal because I could see what was on there and load it like I had before. But wouldn't you know it, a short time later, I get a message from Troy with a pre-release to try and it kind of works like the old Commodore style like this. Check it out. Isn't that freaking awesome? You rock, Troy. You definitely rock. Well, I'll go ahead and load this other program here. Check this out. This is a drawing program that you can use the NES controller to move around the screen and draw or erase. Pretty neat, huh? All right, before we wrap things up here, a couple more things I want to mention. Number one are these episode things that Troy has come up with. These are very cool, highly detailed things like tutorials where he actually shows you how to breadboard things out and has tons of code examples. And this is more like the UF2 file kind of thing. This isn't like a ROM that would run under the basic. So definitely check those out. You may find those interesting. The second thing is this really awesome browser-based emulator that Troy has. This would be really awesome for developing or troubleshooting something. Look, you can see the registers and all this other cool stuff. This is really neat. And you can just double click and load ROMs and play around with them too if you want. Very, very cool. It looks like we're gonna have ourselves another giveaway. The nice folks at Hacker Boxes have graciously offered to send a HackerBox 103 to the lucky comment picked at random. We'll be picking the comment on June 30th. And remember, HackerBox is only ships to US addresses for this giveaway. So if your comment's picked, but you don't have a US shipping address that we can use, we'll need to pick someone else. Good luck. As the time of this recording, there are HackerBox 103s still in stock. So if you don't win the giveaway and want to get one, check them out. Or go ahead and subscribe. I probably sound like a broken record by now, but if it hadn't been for hacker boxes, I probably wouldn't have checked out the Pico 56. So I always like getting the surprise and it gives me something to play with and learn about. Hey, if you made it this far, thanks for watching. Hope to see you again next time. Take care. Bye-bye.